you can hear me. And so today we are going to talk about uh, prostate cancer and the nephrologist, an important topic um, for the nephrologist to consider because it's one of the commonest cancers in this country. So, Dr. Wera, I'm still being heard, right? Yes. Very good. So, um, we would like to know, we would like to say what the nephrologist should know when we're talking about prostate cancer, whether it is for patients who are having dialysis or it is for patients who are going for transplantation. Now, it's good to talk about the people we know. One of my most respected teachers and, and person who has influenced both urology and nephrology is Professor Nelson Awori. Professor Nelson Awori was involved in what the uh, doctor from NHF was talking about, the first kidney transplant in this country. We shall forever be grateful for him, even for the Institute and for with the others having thought of an institute of urology and nephrology. We have somebody whose photograph I couldn't immediately get, that was Dr. Kakiri Dirango, he was my mentor, and he and uh, Professor Awori were some of the early pioneers in the formation of uh, the institute and in uh, the functioning of both urology and nephrology. Yes, Professor L. S. Otieno, uh, another teacher and friend of mine who was involved in a lot of nephrology work uh, in the, uh, the 80s, the 90s, uh, 2000s, and, and he's, he's a pillar of this country. And then, of course, we were sad to have lost this man, a man I have been with for most of my work in urology, Professor Mohammed Abdallah, a great icon of urology. We should all we will always remember him and miss him in the many functions of both urology and nephrology. That is why we are discussing this because nephrologists will be involved in the care of many patients who have impairment and also have cancer. Whether the, uh, the, the impairment caused the cancer or the impairment was caused by the cancer. And of course, you know, function is an important consideration in the management of patients of cancer. And there is a reciprocal relationship between cancer and And when you go back to prostate cancer, there is a paper published in IJC which was talking about how much cancer burden do we have. And in this, Anne Corrine showed us that um, Prostates in Nairobi men with an age standardized incident of 40 per 100,000. And in our paper by ourselves, looking at chronic kidney in patients with, um, with prostate cancer, we were wondering whether uh, prostate cancer has just sprung up in, uh, in patients with uh, prostate cancer. Uh, yes. You are because most you are the one who does a lot of the things, like the one we are presenting now is prostate cancer. We need to, to the Societe Internationale de Urology in Glasgow. Uh, we we noted that the sounds like Professor McDougall with over 2,000 diagnoses annually. Making chronic kidney disease, on the other hand, is an important sequelae of advanced prostate cancer, although data from Africans is scarce and absent in Kenya. Mm, we investigated the incidence of CKD associated with prostate cancer at Kenyatta National Hospital. And we looked at 40 cancer patients, and the results were that 75 patients had the disease and diagnosis. And that's the most that we find in our country. Good. 5% of patients with prostate cancer we present with the metastasis. Most of the remaining patients had locally advanced disease as well. So we had to get early prostate cancer. The mean age was elderly, we agree, as 72 diabetic and 8 were hypertensive. 57.5% of the patients were in renal failure. So uh, Renal failure is an important end game for us dealing with patients with prostate cancer. The majority had uh, more than 140 micromoles per liter of creatinine. Okay. And, and they had to dialyze. 25% okay. 
even after treatment, eventually went into CKD with a GFR of three months following admission. The factors that led to metastatic disease at admission, so those patients who had metastatic disease tended to have CKD. And uh, those who had hydronephrosis on admission and those who had a hemoglobin of less than 10. And that was the clinical presentation of these patients in continence, retroperitoneal metastasis, pulmonary metastasis, no? swelling, hematuria, lumbosacromates, hydronephrosis, and obstructive loin tract symptoms. The, the parameters of admission, the, the average creatinine of the patients with presenting in Kenya, therefore, with, uh, with, with, with prostate cancer, is a creatinine of 310. Clearly, they're going to renal failure with a range of 72 to 976. If you look at the range, so you see some of those patients definitely need dialysis. The PSA was also an important consideration. We knew that the majority of these patients have advanced disease, the PS, the average PS, oh, wait, wait. 10, with a range of 27. Hold on. The troubling thing was the Gleason score, and this was the subject of a meeting we had this afternoon to look at why our patients have such high Gleason score, and probably why they present late. What are the factors in our region that make our patients have such high Gleason score? Uh, because Gleason score is an important predictor of poor uh, poor outcome in these patients. Uh, the hemoglobin was not too bad. The majority had a, a hemoglobin of 10.2 grams per deciliter. And the, the scan there shows the, the hydronephrosis that uh, we were able to see. You can see the hydronephrosis of the left kidney, the hydronephrosis of the right kidney. You can see the, the, the prostate that is causing obstruction in the blood. And the same, you see here, this big uh, prostate in the bladder and the, the, the hydronephrosis of the proximal ureter as, as shown here. So you have severe hydronephrosis and significant bladder outlet obstruction. And that tends to be the end game for a lot of these patients. You can see the huge prostate with a multinodular prostate uh, which showed a glucose eight uh, after biopsy. And, and so our conclusion of the 75% the of these patients presented with aggressive tumors, probably one of the highest in African reports, half of the patients had significant obstructive neuropathy leading to CKD, hydronephrosis and hemoglobin were there, and future studies will be needed to look at this. So because of that, we need to look at screening and how does this relate to, uh, to, to nephrologists. They can help in this. A lot of the patients who would be going for transplantation have a, a systematic PSA screening, and this will increase. Uh, but there are issues to do with that. When you do a lot of screening, then you will delay patients. And the worldwide people who have uh, been screened for PSA tend to delay from transplantation by about three months to three years. Of course, once you have screened them, the treatment is going to depend on the glycine stage, the PSA, and associated comorbidities. And so when you look at CAP, carcinoma of the prostate and uh, chronic kidney disease, you see there is prostate cancer in patients who have end-stage renal disease. And uh, uh, in, in a study from, from the East, uh, there was a name to look at, and this is the biggest that I've, so, I've seen, to, to, to look at the prevalence of prostate cancer in patients with end-stage renal disease, whether they were dialyzing or had had transplants. And uh, the, in this patient, the steroid prostate specific was measured in 724 patients undergoing dialysis, and uh, those who uh, had a PSA of more than four assessed for prostate cancer. And the, the prevalence of prostate cancer was done looking at by doing logistic regression analysis. The prostate cancer prevalence was also assessed in the control groups who had undergone health checks. That is people who didn't have CKD, but had gone for just a normal health check. And in these patients, the prevalence of prostate cancer, this is from the East, from the East was found to be 1.4%. And those of the control group of control from age uh, were 04 
uh, 1.4 and 0.8%. So the odds ratio were 3.49 and 0. and 1.71. So the conclusion was that the prevalence of prostate cancer in end-stage renal disease was equal or higher compared to the normal subject. So the question is, if you're going to be evaluating, if you're going to be screening for these patients, uh, for prostate cancer, should you screen any more than you do for the healthy subjects? And so the screening for uh, for transplantation and others would be questions, but especially if it is going to cause a delay in transplantation. So prostate cancer in stage renal disease is equal to uh, the same as normal health subjects, and the 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 result strongly indicates that the use of serum PSA could lead to early detection of prostate cancer in end-stage renal disease, uh, but it may affect other things, particularly for transplantation. Then there was another study looking at the prevalence and survival of, of prostate cancer in patients with end-stage renal disease. This is a Korean study, a retrospective study. Uh, with those, and they, this was aimed at evaluating the prevalence and prognosis of prostate cancer and end stage renal disease and determine the risk factors for overall survival, cancer specific survival, and evaluate the differences in pre prostate cancer related clinical and therapeutic patterns between patients with and without prostate cancer and end stage renal disease. And um, uh, it was a joint. Uh, point regression, a joint point regression analysis performed to predict the incidence and mortality of prostate cancer survival. Uh, this was done using uh, Kaplan's my survivor curves with wrong, uh, log rank tests of patients with dialysis or transplantation. And of the 3,945 patients with prostate cancer and end stage renal disease, 3.9% were on dialysis and 0.2% uh, had kidney transplantation. Uh, 3,703 3, of these patients were neither on transplant or dialysis. There were 697 uh, prostate cancer specific deaths in these patients. The median survival, uh, uh, prostate cancer survival and five-year survival rates in the non-ES end-stage renal disease and non-transplant, non-end-stage renal disease dialysis and ESRD were significantly different. So there was a difference in, in favor. The presence of end-stage renal disease, age, body mass index, and others were important uh, in, in, the, in the, deciding the, the treatment after diagnosis. So the end-stage renal disease did not influence how the cancer behaved in these patients. So with a conclusion, with a 10.1% nationwide prevalence of patients who have prostate cancer and end-stage renal disease, the presence of end-stage renal disease was a significant uh, survival factor in these patients, but it was not the only factor. And then the, this study was aimed at looking at the prognosis of prostate cancer and end-stage renal disease. Sorry, I'm repeating that. Sorry. And, and when uh, most patients with uh, prostate cancer and end-stage renal disease, uh, when it was, this study looked at these patients and it showed that if you found prostate cancer in, pre -trans in transplant patients, the majority of these had low-grade cancer, which is T1C, low Gleason score, and uh, and uh, those who had surgery, of course, um, because they were detected during the transplantation, but all had excellent survival outcomes. So if you detected patients to have prostate cancer during evaluation for transplant, or they developed prostate cancer during their life after transplantation or end-stage renal disease, their survival was good after treatment. So it is good to be looking for this prostate cancer uh, in, in this sense because prostate cancer does not affect the overall mortality. And the renal failure is the main determining factor of the survival, the mortality. And kidney transplantation 
is the most important factor in this end stage renal disease. Their development of prostate cancer does not affect their survival. And so, when we're using it as a prerequisite condition for solid organ malignant assessment during uh, these patients and making them ineligible for kidney transplantation, we may be doing these patients a disservice. Thank you very much. But the most important message of that was that patients should not be delayed from having treatment because of their prostate cancer status if they are. But of course, nephrologists would be involved in the care of patients with prostate cancer throughout their life. Thank you. So I'll say it again about the transplantation. A patient with prostate cancer and chronic kidney disease on dialysis, uh, once the cancer is treated, you can comfortably transplant. Uh, you can comfortably transplant. Yes, that's the message. You can comfortably transplant patients who have had prostate cancer and have had their treatment. And if patients develop prostate cancer during their treatment with for end-stage renal disease or during transplantation or whether they had transplantation or end-stage renal disease, this does not affect their life. What will affect their life is the end-stage renal disease and transplantation itself. Uh, are, there, are there intervals that um, you would like to be observed between the cure for prostate cancer and uh, the transplantation? All we would need to do, thanks, Dr. Wade, all we would need to do is to ensure that we have given the maximum possible treatment and we have optimized our patient to being cancer-free. And, and we probably don't even need to wait for, for years to see that these patients are cancer-free. And I know this is one of the questions we've been asking ourselves. We, we, must not, we should not exclude patients who have um, uh, raised PSA from having a transplantation. Even if they had uh, prostate cancer, what we need to do is offer them optimum treatment. The end stage renal disease or transplantation does not change their life. Uh, can you give us uh, an idea of the lines of research that you'd like to carry out in Iaki on prostate cancer? Uh, thanks, Dr. Wery. Yes, we, we need to do a lot of research, just like I said about an hour ago. We need to look at something that may be common between us and the, uh, and the nephrologists, and that is the role of pesticides in development of uh, high malignant prostate cancer, pesticides and herbicides, by doing whole genome sequencing of prostate cancers, which would then tell us what the risk factors we do. We would then be able to do genomic epidemiology uh, to look at prostate cancer. And of course, prostate cancer sometimes may lead to end-stage renal disease. And the use of these pesticides and herbicides may also cause nephrotoxicity, which may lead to end-stage renal disease. So whatever mutations that would be caused by the use of these herbicides or pesticides is something that would be of interest to us because we have so much use of pesticides and herbicides in the country for growing of various crops and for control of various diseases, including like now, the control of locust invasion in this region. The other area of research that we shall need to, to, to know is uh, the, uh, the prostate cancers, the, these high grade prostate cancers that we tend to have, uh, what are the determinants of that, of that uh, high, high grade cancer and are there infective or other factors that lead to development of, of very high grade prostate cancers in the men of this country because as we've had in the media in the recent past prostate cancer to be tends to be a source of significant mortality for men in this country probably higher than you find in the western world and then of course the patients present with the metastasis of uh, 75% presenting with the metastasis, while in the Western world, uh, probably less than 5% present with metastasis. So there's something we are missing. And it could, and we, our, a lot of our patients also tend to present very early. You see 40 year olds, I have right now a 40 year old who has metastatic prostate cancer, which is not seen in the rest of the world. What is it in our environment or in our genetics? that uh, has led to this type of
this is thank you very much dr Vera.